Well, good morning to you all. My name's Sean. I'm one of the pastors here at Harbor Church, uh, and we're continuing our Ephesians sermon series this morning. So if you have a Bible, grab it, open it up to Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna look at verses three through six uh, this morning. As you're doing that, our ushers will come forward. If you'd like a Bible, raise your hand. They'll give you one, but get to Ephesians. There'll be some stuff on the screen, but I'd love to have you, for you to have a Bible in front of you. As you're turning there, there's been a long practice in the Christian church of teaching and preaching and training God's people in the ways of faith. And for the first 1,500 years of the life of the church, it was common practice for people, for Christians, to memorize the Lord's Prayer, to memorize the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments. And that would be a good practice for us this morning. How many of you have the Ten Commandments memorized? Probably show your hands. I don't know if you feel bold to say that. Lord's Prayer, maybe. How many of you even know what the Apostles' Creed is? These were core things, core teachings of the church that Christians memorized for centuries. But about the time of the Reformation, it began to change a little bit. And the practice of, of catechesis, of, of reciting catechisms, came into vogue. It was the, the way that from the Reformation onward, Christians were trained and disciples, discipled. Catechism is this question and answer format where questions are posed and answers are given that uh, uh, um, teach deep and rich theology. These questions answer some of the most profound and important questions of life. Many of you probably know this. One of the most famous catechisms in the Christian church, at least in the English tradition, is the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which begins with that incredible question, what is the chief end of man? We know that question. Probably many of us know that question. What is the chief end of man? What better starting point could there be to understand good, deep, rich theology? What are we here for? What are we doing? Why were we created? And many of you probably know the answer. What is the chief end of man? Anyone want to shout out the answer? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's right. That's the chief end of man according to the Westminster Catechism, Shorter Catechism. And for centuries, men, women, children have been taught the answer to this question. But let's take that question and flip it just for a moment here. If man's chief end is to glorify God, then what is the chief end of God himself? How might we answer that question? What is the chief end of God? And that's a really important question to get right. We know our end, our aim, our purpose, but what about God? Now, in 1984, John Piper preached the message at Wheaton Chapel on this topic. He said in that sermon, he said, I have four boys at home. And if you ask them, what is the most important thing to your dad? And if they said, well, I don't know. He said, I'd be disappointed. I'd be crushed. I might even be angry. It's important for the children to know what is important to their parents, what their parents are pursuing, what their parents are giving their lives to. In the same way, it's important for us to know what are God's purposes. And in that sermon in 1984, John Piper gave an answer to that question. What is the chief end of God? The chief end of God is to glorify God. That might sound plausible, might sound interesting, that might sound fascinating, but is that really true? Does the Bible teach us that the chief end of God is to glorify God? Or to put that another way, Why does God do what he does? Does God always work to the praise of his glory and for the sake of his name? What is God's chief end? And does the Bible bear this out? Well, I think it does. I think the Bible gives us great evidence that God's chief end is to glorify himself. But don't take my word for it. Let me just give you a pile of verses that we're gonna look at here for just a moment to see God's great aim, that his end and everything he does is to glorify himself, to make his name great, and to bring about the praise of the glory of his grace. I'm leaning heavily on Piper here for a few minutes because he's the first one to open my eyes to these realities. But let's just look and see, does the Bible teach us that God's aim is to glorify himself? Why did God create us? Why did God create humanity? Isaiah 43, Isaiah writes, God speaks, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name who I created for my glory. Why did God choose a people and make Israel his possession? Jeremiah 13, I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. 
Why did God rescue them from bondage in Egypt? Psalm 106, our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works, yet he saved them for his name's sake and he make make known his mighty power. Or why did God spare them in the wilderness? Ezekiel 20, but I acted for the sake of my name that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. Why did, God cast, why, did, why did God not cast his people away when they rejected him as king? For Samuel 12, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with your heart. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. And why did God bring his people back from exile? Isaiah 48, uh, 9 and 11. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you that you may not be cut off. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how shall my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Why did the son of God, why did Jesus come to this earth for the hour of his crucifixion? John 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. This was Jesus' purpose. Finally, why will Jesus return on the great day of his consummation? 2 Thessalonians chapter one. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Over and over and over again, we see that God works for the sake of his name, that God works for his glory, that God works for the praise of the glory of his grace. The biblical evidence is strong that this is the purpose of God, that this is his will, that the chief end of God is to glorify God and to bring praises to his name. And this is what we will see as we come to our text in Ephesians this morning. We're continuing our Ephesians sermon series, looking at this this queen of the epistles as that has been called. And today and next week and the week following, for three weeks here, we're gonna sit in the same text and we're gonna dwell in one of the most glorious sentences in all of the Bible. For the next three weeks, we're gonna look at Ephesians chapter one, verses 3 through 14, this opening of Paul's great letter. And he writes some of the most profound things concerning God's grand, global, ultimate, cosmic purposes for us and for our world. The sweeping things of all of redemptive history, Paul reveals to us in these verses here. In this beautiful text, we see Paul praising the Godhead, the three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each for their unique roles in redemptive history. Now this sentence here, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, in the original Greek is one long poetic sentence. Paul is so caught up in the glories of God, so caught up in the majesty, the splendor of who God is and what he has done, he can't stop to even take a breath. And so he continues to pour himself out over and over in this poetic doxology, glorifying each person of the Trinity. We'll read it in just a moment. But if you ever wonder, Does the Bible speak about the Trinity? Here's one text you can point them to because we see Father, Son, and Spirit all here in this one text. Verses three through six, Paul highlights God the Father for his work of predestination. Verses seven through 10, he shifts to the Son and his work of redemption. 11 through 14, the Holy Spirit's work of sealing us for God. And so for the next three weeks, we're gonna be in this text. And I want to show you Paul's great praise of the Father, of the Son, of the spirit, that we would join him in that very same praise. We're gonna see some pretty glorious things here, friends. We're gonna see the plans, the purposes, the ultimate work of God. And I hope this week and every week forward that you will say, man, I, I see that there, I see what Paul, what God has revealed here. And I hope you walk away saying, man, what a glorious God that we worship. This morning, we dive into three through six and we have much reason to praise God. God has predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters to the praise of his glorious grace. Or to put it another way, 
God has chosen us to make his glory known. I hope you see that in our text this morning. Let's turn there. Ephesians chapter one. I'm gonna read verses three through 14, even though we're gonna look at three through six, but I want you to get the context and hear all of what Paul would say. Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might also be the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Oh God, as we turn to your word, reveal to us these wonderful things that Paul has seen, these astounding and glorious truths of who you are and what you have done. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. Reveal your splendor and your majesty and make us to see you, who you are and what you have done. Oh God, would you glorify yourself in our midst and cause us to bless you with everything that we are. Oh God, we long to have ears to hear and eyes to see. And so God, open our ears, give us eyes and speak now by your spirit for we are listening, amen. Well, how does Paul begin this section? Ephesians chapter one, verse three, this marvelous sentence, Paul says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here Paul is planting himself firmly in a long tradition of blessing God. All throughout the Old Testament, great men and women of the faith have blessed God. We read about it this morning. Psalm 103, verses one and two begin, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits. Paul just jumps right in with that praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This blessing of God is the banner that flies over all that Paul would say. This is his thesis statement for us as we get into this section. Paul wants us, like him, to bless God, bless the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for his unique work in redemptive history. And Paul goes on to give us three reasons here why we should bless him. And then he also tells us God's ultimate purpose in doing these things. Remember the question, What is the chief end of God? Paul will answer that for us this morning. Three reasons why to praise God and the ultimate purpose of God in doing these things. So why bless God? That's what we're gonna look at here. Three reasons why we are to bless God. But before we do that, notice, as we work through this passage, verses three through six, verses three through 14, who is the actor in all of these things? Pay attention to that. Who is the one doing the work? Who is the one who is being called out as the the prime mover, so to say, in this section? It's God. Over and over again, Paul says, he did this. He has done that. He's doing these things. It is God who works in all of these things. It is nothing that we have done here. It is totally and completely a work of God. And so three reasons why Paul blesses God and why we should too. Reason number one, verse three, he has blessed us in Christ. Look at verse three with me. Paul says, blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Why bless God? Because God has blessed us. Blessing God is the natural and right response to what God has done for us. That's not hard to understand, friends. We get that even in our day. 
you give someone a gift, they give back to you in exchange, right? There's this reciprocity type of thing that happens. We're kind of conditioned and trained for those things. When we're complimented, we compliment back. When we're blessed, we bless back. And I don't think that's necessarily a natural thing because we are uh, sinful. We are, by nature, selfish beings, but we're trained in this way of thinking and, and doing. I scratch your back, you scratch my back, right? If you don't believe me, just give someone a gift and see if they don't try to give you something back or bless you back in return. When we are blessed, we want to bless in response. And it's this very same thing here. Paul says, bless God, because he has blessed us. But Paul can't leave it there. Notice what Paul goes on to say, how he elaborates on the extravagance of God's blessing. With what has God blessed us? Look again at verse three. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Oh, that is fantastic. Not only has God blessed us, but he has richly lavished blessing upon us over and over again with every blessing. Do you see that? Paul says that. God has blessed us with every blessing, with every spiritual blessing God has blessed us. Do you know God has blessed you with every blessing? God doesn't hold out on you. God doesn't skimp when he blesses. When God pours out his blessing, he goes all the way 100% because he's a good father who wants to bless his children. Now, how many of you in the room are grandparents? Show of hands. Any grandparents out there? Amen. Praise God for you grandparents. We need more of you at our church. So bring your friends. Bring them here, please. We need more grandparents in our church. Uh, grandparents do a great job of blessing their grandchildren, right? I mean, like it's in the job description. Spoil your grandkids rotten is like the job description of grandparent. Give them all the praise, all the fun, all the experiences, all the affection, all the love, all the sugar that they want. And then send them home to mom and dad, right? That's what a grandparent does. And good job for doing that, grandparents. I, I love that. Uh, you know, it was just Valentine's Day recently. And, and my mom loves me, loves my wife. And so she gave us little Valentine's Day cards and little chocolate things. It was a, it was a nice gift. And I'm appreciative of that. But for the grandkids, they got boxes of stuff, huge boxes of toys and candy and clothes and jewelry. And if my mom could have shoved a pony into the box, I'm sure she would have given them a pony because that's what grandparents do. They just pour out blessing upon blessing on their grandkids, right? This is what God does to us, my friends, only more abundantly than a grandparent would for a grandkid because God does not skimp on the blessings. God has given us every spiritual blessing. It's who he is. Our text says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now note here, some translators might say God has blessed us or given us every blessing of the spirit. That's because when we think about spiritual blessings, we get a little weird about spiritual stuff today. Google, uh, what does it mean to be a spiritual person? And you'll find long lists and top 10 ways to be a spiritual person. And not a one of them has to do with the almighty God above us or connecting with him. It's all about transcendence and other weirdness, new agey types of things. So don't hear spiritual blessedness thinking about new age guru types of spiritual things. These are blessings of God's spirit. Almost every single time Paul uses this word spiritual, he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God blesses us with every spiritual blessing. For us, or for, for Paul, to be filled, to be blessed with these spiritual blessings is to be filled with God's spirit, is to be blessed with the indwelling of God's spirit, the filling of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. This is God's blessing upon us. It is God giving his own spirit to us that we might be filled, that we might act and live the life of human flourishing that God desires for us through the power of the Spirit. This doesn't mean we get physical blessings, not that we get great treasures to have in this life or tangible things to hold in our hands, but our blessing is an, an, in another place. It is elsewhere. And where are those blessings? Paul tells us, look again at verse three. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Our blessing is in the heavenly places, not here in this world. And that makes them greater and better blessings, at least in my mind, because the blessings of this life, the tangible things in this life, they're prone to decay, to rot, 
to rust, to going away, to being stolen, but not God's blessings, not the spiritual blessings in the heavenly place. In fact, Jesus tells us, do not lay up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but instead lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where no thieves can break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. The blessing of God with every spiritual blessing is in the heavenly places, which in my mind says they're even greater than what we could receive in this life. They're eternal. They are fulfilling, they are lasting, and they can never be destroyed. And how do we get these blessings? I want those. I hope you want them too. How do we get these spiritual blessings that God desires for us through Jesus Christ? Look at verse three one more time. Look, who has blessed us in Christ. It is in Christ that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It is in our union with Jesus that we are blessed. It is in Christ that we receive the blessings. And this phrase in Christ comes up over and over and over and over again. It is in Christ, in our union with Jesus Christ, that God makes his glory known and blesses us with every spiritual blessing. Are you in Christ, my friend? Do you know Jesus? Do you have faith in Jesus? Are you connected to Jesus? Then if so, you are blessed by God with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And therefore, there is great reason to give God praise. Reason number one, to praise God. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Reason the second we have to praise God, we'll look at verse four. He has chosen us. Paul goes on to give us the second reason. Look at verse four. Even as he, this is God's doing, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. You see, Paul praises God because he chose us in him. Now there's some really important theological things we have to unpack here. Notice first, who does the choosing? I said it before, but this is God's action, right? Even as he, God, the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, even as he chose us in him. It is clear from this text that God is the one who is doing the choosing. Throughout verses three through 14, the emphasis is on God's initiative in redeeming his people. It is God who blesses, God who chooses, God who adopts, God who redeems, God who reveals. This passage shows us over and over again God's initiative. And this is vital for us to understand. In the work of redemption, God is the initiator, the actor, the mover. God is the one who does the work. We are little more than passive recipients in God's work of redemption. We saw this when we looked at Exodus chapter six. It was God saying, I will, I will do, I will do, I will do these things. The people of Israel were a, a people enslaved to the greatest superpower in the world at the time, the most technologically advanced society in that day. These people of Israel were slaves, captive to them. What did they do to bring about their redemption? Nothing. They stood by and watched God perform miraculous signs and wonders and Pharaoh kicked them out, said, get out of here, you guys. They did nothing to warrant their redemption. And so the saying is true. You bring nothing to your salvation, but the sin that makes it necessary. All of the work of your redemption is God's work, my friends. God is the one who does all of this. And the point here is that it is God who does the choosing. God is the sovereign one. God acts according to his will, according to his grand design. You did not choose, rather you were chosen by God. And Paul tells us that very clearly here in this text. He chose us in him. Now, who's Paul talking about? Who is this us in him? He chose us in him. Who are these people? Well, they are the saints in Ephesus and the saints that he's writing this letter to. That is you and I, if we are in Christ, if we are in him, then Paul is writing to us and we are the ones who God has chosen in Christ. Those who are in Christ, who are in union with Jesus, they're the ones whom God has chosen. So are you in Christ? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Then if so, you have been chosen by God. Now, 
There's a popular show on TV right now, The Chosen, right? How many of you are watching The Chosen? Anybody watching The Chosen? Pretty fun, fun show to watch. I bet many of you have seen it, but it's fascinating. The very same word that Jesus uses or that, that Luke uses when he chooses the 12 disciples, exact same word that Paul uses here. So if you've been united to Christ, if you are in Christ, you are chosen of God, just like the people in that show, the disciples, just like those who are following after Jesus. If you're united with Christ, then you truly are part of the chosen of God. Now, another important thing here, when, when did God do this choosing? This blows my mind. This is incredible here. When does God do this? Before the foundation of the world. What a statement. Before there ever was anything, before the foundations of the world were laid, God sovereignly chose us in him. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? God's foreknowledge, God's choosing, God's decree, God's marvelous and incredible wisdom that before anything was created, God knew who he would choose to be his own, that he would choose his people, that he would unite them to his son, Jesus, to be the recipients of every spiritual blessing. And all of this, friends, happens 100% completely and totally outside of you. The reformers had a term for this, the Latin extra nos, outside ourselves. All of this happens outside of anything inside of us. Before the foundations of the world, before we were born, before there was any even a, a figment of an imagination of who you might be, God chose from the very, very beginning. It is God's sovereign, electing, predestining, choosing, which happened before the foundation of the world, long before any of us ever existed. And so let's be clear on one point here. You and I had nothing to do with God's choosing. It is purely by his act by his will, by his grace. It is purely God's sovereign, free, electing will that brings any of us into his kingdom. Now question, did you know that God's love is not unconditional? Now we, we talk about, all right, God has unconditional love. I don't know if that's actually biblically accurate because I see in scripture a lot of conditions on the ones that God loves. God loves those who are righteous, those who obey him, who do what he says. And God hates the wicked. He hates the unrighteous. There are conditions on God's love. And your salvation is conditional as well. Not on your works, but it's conditioned on faith and on repentance. We must believe in Jesus. We must repent of our sin if we're going to be saved. Our salvation is conditional, but not God's election. God's election, God's predestiny of us is the only unconditional thing in our, this work of salvation. God's election is unconditional in every possible way. And we see that in our text. Before there ever was anything, God chose us. Before the foundations of the world, God chose us. And so God's will, God's, by his decree, by his design, God chose us to be in him. And friends, to me, this is beautiful, wonderful, sweet news. Because if our election is unconditional, if God's choosing of us has no merit in myself, if it's not something I have done, purely, totally based on God's gracious choice, then there's nothing I can do to lose my salvation. It is secure. If it's based on only what God has done, then there's no way I can screw it up and wander away from it. And this should bring us some of the greatest joys in the Christian life. The doctrine of unconditional election goes right along with the perseverance of the saints. And we see this in Romans 8, 29 and 30. You're probably familiar with this passage, but listen to what Paul says, how he connects our predestination to our glorification. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now here it is. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Do you see the connection? Do you see what Paul is linking together here? Those whom he predestined, he glorified. And so if God has predestined us from the beginning before the foundations of the world, then we will be glorified with him one day in his kingdom. God's predestined of us and him necessarily results in our glorification. And so take heart this morning, friend. Christian, praise God for his choosing of you. For because he has chosen you, 
you will persevere and meet him one day in his glory. Now, some people object to this idea of predestination and election. They have a hard time with it in the scriptures, but friends, it is plainly, clearly written here, taught page after page in the scriptures, and especially in Ephesians 1. It was the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said this about election. He said, whatever may be said about the doctrine of election, it is written in the word of God as with an iron pen, and there is no getting rid of it. To me, it is one of the sweetest, most blessed truths in the whole of Revelation. And those who are afraid of it are so because they do not understand it. If they could but know that the Lord has chosen them, it would make their hearts dance with joy. What a beautiful word picture that is, to make our hearts dance with joy. Spurgeon knew his Bible. He was the prince of preachers, he's been called. He knew the doctrine of election, that God chose us, and that it was the sweetest and most blessed truth for him in all of God's revelation. And his heart was filled with great joy. And so is Paul's. And so Paul just erupts with praise. Blessed be God, for he has chosen us in him. And friends, if you've been chosen by God, then you too should see the glories of God in choosing you and should respond in praise to him to give God all the glory that he is due, just like Paul has done. And so we should rejoice in the predestining work of God so clearly displayed for us. This is the gospel, that God, outside of ourselves, before the foundations of the world, made a way for us to come to him, that he reached in and grabbed us and through Jesus brought us into relationship with him. And it truly is good news. If we jump back to Ephesians chapter one, verse four, one more thing I wanna draw out of this verse. Paul says he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, but to what end? Why would God do this? That we would be holy and blameless before him. We were chosen to be holy and blameless, to be saints, as we talked about last week, dedicated to God, walking in righteousness before him. Your election, your, the predestined work of God, your being chosen by God is not a free pass to live however hell would want you to live. It is not a free pass to just go on with all of the sins because somehow God has chosen me and because of that, I'm, I'm now glorified or will be glorified. It is no excuse to continue on in sin. No, the result of God's work is that he would make us like his son, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Friend, if you've been elected by God, then you must walk holy and blameless before him. Does your life look like that of a saint? We talked about it last week, but this is the purpose of God for why he has chosen us in Christ, that we should be conformed to the image of his son. This is why you were chosen. So live holy and blameless before God. We should examine our hearts this morning. If we know Christ, if we are in Christ, why is there still, still sin in our lives? Why have we not repented for the sins that we have committed this past week? Why are we not walking holy and blameless before him? Friends, we need to do that by his power, in his grace, but we must walk holy and blameless before God. Reason number one, to praise God. He has blessed us in Christ. Reason number two, to praise God. He has chosen us in Christ. And reason number three, he has adopted us through Christ. Look at verse five. What does Paul say? In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So what's reason number three why Paul has praising, is praising God? He has adopted us. Now, I would imagine in a crowd this size, there are some of you who have probably been adopted in your life. And I know for a fact, there are people here who have adopted children. And that's such a beautiful picture of the gospel in my mind. What is adoption? Is it not going to find someone who's not biologically part of your family? and say, now you belong, you are part of my family, you are part of the group, and every blessing that would be for the, the biological children is for you. You are part of this family now, and everything that a biological child would have is now for you. You have the same inheritance, the same love, the same sense of belonging. You're no longer an outsider, a guest, an alien. 
but you belong to the family. And you're brought in with great love and great care. And you receive all of the benefits of belonging as part of the family. So it is with us who are in Christ. So it is with us who are in Christ. We belong to God as his children. This is who we are. This is why I think some of us ought to go through the process of adopting children. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. If you want to image the gospel to our world, adopt children. Say, you don't belong to me, but I'm going to take you in as God has adopted me. And understand who we are. Praise God that we become part of the family of God, that in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons. And as sons and daughters, then we are heirs of the promises of God. And how is all of this done? Paul tells us it is through Jesus Christ. We are adopted through Jesus. Again, going back to our union with Christ, we receive the blessings of Christ because of it. We are elect because of it. We are chosen because of it. And we are adopted through our union with Jesus. Did you know that you're an adopted child of God? If you are in Christ, then you have become a part of his family. And Paul shows us so much of our identity here. We are blessed. We are chosen. We are adopted. We are saints. We are in Christ. This is who you are, friend, if you know Jesus. You are blessed. You are chosen. You are an adopted saint connected in union with Jesus. And for this reason, we have much reason to praise God. And so we should give him our praise. God has blessed us. God has chosen us. And God has adopted us as children. And now the big question, why does God do all of these things? What are God's ultimate purposes in doing all of these things? Back to the question of the beginning. What is the chief end of God? I said it was to glorify God. And we see that here in this passage, Paul tells us why God does these things in verses five and six. Stay with the train of thought. God has blessed us. God has chosen us. God has adopted us. And then verse five, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is incredible. Do you see what Paul is saying here? It's like the Wizard of Oz, where they get to peel the curtain back and see Oz behind the curtain. Paul is peeling back the curtain to show us God's grand, glorious purposes. But rather than seeing a minuscule, small, teeny tiny little man, we see God Almighty and his purposes for the universe, for all of redemptive history. This is according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. God has done all of this for the praise of his glorious grace. Let's put that another way. God has done everything he has in this work of adopting, of choosing, of blessing us, that his glorious grace might be praised. God acts for the grace of his glory. God acts to reveal his grace to us, and to reveal his glory in us and through us. And it is all of this according to his purpose. All that God has done and all that God will do is for this one singular purpose, for this one singular end, to make much of his glorious grace. And so as I said at the beginning, I think we see it here in Ephesians 1. The chief end of God is to glorify God. This is what Paul shows us here. God acts for his glory. He has blessed us to the praise of his glory. He has chosen us to the praise of his glorious grace. He has predestined us for adoption as sons to the praise of his glory. And all the works of God are for this one end towards this one purpose, to the praise of his glorious grace. And as Paul has seen these things, as he considers these things, he can't help but erupt in this glorious doxology and praise of God in this text. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, who has chosen us, who has adopted us to the praise of his glorious grace. Friends, this is what we see here in this text, that God has blessed and chosen and adopted us to the praise of his glory. All that God does is to the praise of his glory. This is his chief end, and therefore it must be our chief end as well. 
as saints in Christ, blessed, chosen, adopted through Jesus, we must do all we can then to show the surpassing grandness, the immeasurable worth, the incalculable greatness of the glory of the grace of God Almighty. We must do whatever is necessary to display the greatness of the glory of the grace of God. And we must stop at nothing to bring maximum glory to God Almighty. In every situation, in every instance, in everything we do, we need to understand God's ultimate purposes that we can pursue those same things as well. And so we must be a people who bring great praise to God, this God of glory and this God of grace. This is why we were created. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him together. The chief end of God is to glorify God. And if this is why we were created, then this is what we must do to display the greatness of the glory of the grace of God. How's that going for us, church? How are we doing at displaying the glory of God in our midst? as a watching world looks on from outside, as they see us, as they observe our lives, do our lives give testimony to the great and awesome glory of God, the God who has chosen you, who's blessed you, who's adopted you? Does your life reflect that glory? And does a watching world see God as they look at you? Does our worship, does our play, praise display the greatness of God's glory? Does the way we work, does the way we play, does the way we serve, does the things we do show that we serve an awesome and powerful, majestic and sovereign God? Does the way we parent and teach our children show them the greatness of God in our lives, that we're gripped by the grace, by the purposes of God? Does the intensity of our pursuit of the Lord reflect his grand, great glory? or would a watching world look at us and say, we're just playing games at this. Friends, may that not be the case. May we pursue the glory of God. May we do all we can to live holy and blameless before him, to be people filled with his grace, filled with his glory, and to pour that out on the world around us. We are not playing games at this, brothers and sisters. There are ultimate realities being revealed to us in these texts here. Paul is telling us great grand, glorious, wonderful things, and we should connect ourselves to those things in Christ. And so we must be a people who display the greatness of the glory of the grace of God. Paul was a man radically gripped, sold out to the praise and the glory of God. And friends, we like Paul must bless God with all that we are. We must bless him for blessing us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We must bless him for choosing us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And we must bless him for adopting us as sons and daughters through Christ. We must bless God for the greatness of the glory of his grace that we come to see most clearly in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if you're a saint in Christ, then bless God today with all that you are and bless God tomorrow with all that you are. And day after day after day, bless God for the greatness of his glorious grace. Pursue and display the glory of the grace of God in every area and aspect of your life. For the chief end of God is to glorify God. And therefore the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. Let's pray. We bless you, Lord. Father, we bless you this morning. We bless you for who you are, the sovereign God over all things, and we thank you and praise you for your glorious work. God, you've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and we thank you for those blessings. We thank you for the blessing of your spirit, for his gifts, for his fruits, for his indwelling power in our lives. And we thank you that the treasures you long to give us are secure. They will never rot or decay or go bad, but they are forever eternal in your kingdom. And God, we bless you that you've chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we had no part to play in our redemption and our salvation. God, we thank you for that. 
We thank you that our salvation is secure because it depends solely on you. And we long for the day when we will one day be glorified in your presence. And God, we think that we've been adopted into your family. And so Lord, I ask that you help us to praise you, to bless you as Paul does. Help us to walk holy and blameless as saints, blessed, chosen, adopted. Help us to know who you've made us to be, God. More than anything else, I pray that you would help us give you the glory that you are due. And so do this, Lord, by the power of your spirit and for the sake of your name. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.